Hey, everyone out there, Dan here, aka the Comic Concierge. And with this being the last Friday of the month, I thought I'd start a new tradition where I go through this past month's comics and pick out some of my favorite covers that came out, uh, a top 10 as you will. And when it comes to comic book covers, maybe I'm a little bit old school or old fashioned when it comes to my thinking in the sense of when I see a cover, what I really love about covers first and foremost is story and how it links to the comic I'm about to read. There are a lot of great covers out there that I think have great artistry that are well rendered and look beautiful, but to me may not be great covers. They just don't have much story to them. They really have nothing to do with the comic you're going to read and you can put it just about anything. So when I look for covers, the first thing I'm looking for is how much does this prepare me as a reader for I'm about to read? Does it help me subvert expectations? Does it give me an understanding of what the book's going to be like, either story-wise or tonally? That's the number one thing I look for. The other piece is creativity. So there are some covers on this that maybe don't pertain exactly to the story, but they're creative in their design, they're unique, and that's why they stood out to me. There are a lot of covers out there that I think look great or great images, but I don't think are effective in those two elements. For example, a cover I know a lot of people love this past month was Art Germ's cover for Heroes Reborn number one. And I get it, it looks great. There's no denying that. I mean, I have no artistic skill myself and I can still look at that and say, man, that's fantastic. However, as a comic book cover, I don't think it's very effective. I don't think there's much story in that cover. I don't see anything about the, the issue I'm about to read. My thought is, is this a Wonder Woman book? Of course, with Power Princess being a, you know very much inspired by that character. But again, I could put this cover on pretty much anything. And the other thing with Art Trim is that I think he, of course, is a great artist, but his covers tend to have a similar design each and every time. Like, you tell me a character, you tell me he's doing it, in my mind, I'm probably going to know what it's going to look like. There are some exceptions to that. And again, I'm not saying he's a bad artist, but when I'm looking for covers, what really stands out to me is creativity, ingenuity, and story. So those are the key things that I'm looking for when I picked out my covers this week. So if there are covers that maybe you loved or you thought were great and maybe didn't make my list, maybe I simply missed it because there are a lot of covers out there. Maybe simply it wasn't my cup of tea or what I really love. So, and again, these are just my 10 favorite. There may be, there's plenty more that I like this week month, but let's start by looking at my first cover. And these aren't necessarily any, in any particular order, but I am saving my favorite for the last. So let's get to the first cover. First up, we have Jenny Zero, number one, and this by Margetta King. And why is this a great cover to me? Again, I think when it comes to comic book covers, there's nothing more important than a number one, especially for an indie series. It's one thing you know, for a new Spider-Man comic to come out, because I have an idea of what that character is. But if you're an indie book and you're brand new, you're trying to garner an audience. And the, I think the best way you do that is by telling people what your book's going to be about to catch their eye. And to me, when I'm looking at that number one, is like, do I have an idea what the story is going to be? And this cover really hits that. So right from the start, I can definitely tell with this gigantic footprint that clearly monsters or kaiju are going to be dealing with this. And with our hero, you know, basically flattened on the ground, clearly she's a person that's struggling. That's well and good within itself. But where it goes a little bit deeper is what's within that footprint as well. We see tracings of things like alcohol bottles and drugs and clearly representing the, the struggle that this character is undergoing. So I know and this is a book about monsters. Most likely this is a character that's fighting monsters, but there's often other struggles that she's facing beyond that. So it's not just your typical kaiju type of battle or trying to do something diff with, different with it. And I'll say this was a first issue I really didn't love that much, but reason I was really interested in it was this cover, but I do think the cover is effective at giving you an understanding of what the story is going to be, what this general struggles will be, and it sets it up really beautifully in, in that sense. So, and even just looking at this cover makes you think, maybe I need to go back and reread the first issue, maybe there are things that I didn't give enough credit, or maybe, you know, try the issue number two and I can rework some of the issues I had with the first issue. But generally, just looking at the cover, I think it's hitting those notes that I'm talking about. I see story, I see creativity, and I, and I see a cover that does a good job of setting expectations for me as a reader, especially for a book that I knew nothing about. If I'm looking at the shelves, looking what's there, this is telling me pretty much everything I need to know before I even turn the first page. I'm only on my second cover and I'm already cheating a little bit. Hey, it's my covers. I can cheat if I want to, but it's a bit of a cheat because I'm including two covers with this selection for Adam Strange number 10 with cover A done by Mitch Gerard and cover B done by 
dog, Shainer. And if, if you've been reading this series, you know that Shainer and Gerard have been splitting duties on the book, and their styles actually are, are quite different. You know, Doc Shainer's style is very much in the sense of like an idyllic look at superheroes, it's kind of a, a classic style in that sense. Mr. Gerard, I feel like he's a superhero hero artist that isn't drawing superhero comics in a way they're much more down the earth I mean, of course fits for books like mr miracle where things are a bit more full of dread and characters are shown in a more realistic light so seeing those two opposing styles i think has been one of the biggest benefits of strange academy and they show that too with their colors although with their cover design i do feel like shaner's style is in a way becoming more akin to mitch gerard's and i feel like that's not done by accident as this story has been going further and further. We're seeing that veneer of the story of Adam Strange's original story and what happened to him kind of dissipate. And now that the, the two sides are becoming more one in the same, And I just love the design, the covers in general, the, you know, with Gerard's having Elena Strange in her hand, kind of brushing away mist. But that mist is, I think, clearly representing a, a lot of the, the cloud that has been surrounding them in the story that has been taking up. Basically, they've been fighting these pikes and potentially there was this genocide that they're trying to determine what happened or not. There's a lot to talk about plot wise, but I do think that the covers themselves maybe. If you're an outsider looking in and you haven't been reading this series, it doesn't seem like there is a lot of story there, but I think certainly there is. I think it's purposeful too that you see Elena wiping that cloud away where Strange is not, and he's very much living within it. And I think that definitely is a key to like what's going on with this book. Also and just great texture for both of the books as well. They feel like living objects. And, and I love the series covers in general. Like this has been a series that has had really consistent great covers with it every time out. I know now it's been, I think it used to be in a monthly series, but I think it's now twice a month or, or every other month or something like that. But and generally when it came to the covers, they're certainly bringing it. And I've had misgivings and enjoyment of, of the series here and there. It's been kind of a hard one to keep with, but at least one thing that's remained consistent is the fact that you know you're getting a good cover every time out. My next cover comes from David Romero, and it's a cover he did for Ice Cream Man number 24. And I should say that when it came to selecting covers, I did try to stick away from exclusive covers, covers that you couldn't get for cover price, covers that are hard to find, because I feel like that's no fun. Because personally, I'm not a person that buys a comic just for the cover, rarely. Like, I'll maybe choose a specific cover I like the most, but in a rare occasion will I buy a comic just for the cover because, you know, I buy comics most times to read them. And because of that, I rarely will ever spend more than cover price for a comic book. However, I did look through, and there were a few that I felt like were deserving of talking about it because, again, that key element of creativity. So I did include it, which is why I included David Romero's cover because this one is falls into the line of being an exclusive cover, although... I do did see a number of websites where you can get it, and it's reasonably priced compared to some of those covers that are like $50 for a comic, which I think is... Anyways, that's an entire another soapbox for another day. Why did I choose this cover? Well, I think you can kind of see just in its design, man. This is what nightmares are made out of, and it, it does to me fit the mold of Ice Cream Man. Now, this doesn't tell me anything about the story of Ice Cream Man, so again, maybe breaking my own rules, but it does fit into the idea of creativity and ingenuity in the sense of taking that concept of the ice cream man you know we think ice cream man they they bring sweet treats to us across the town and you know with that catchy song and but if this guy is your ice cream man you're hiding your children immediately just scooping the face the face the the, the facial expression that is just 
disgusting to look at, but done in, in, in a clever way. And I think the colors here are, are strong as well, setting setting the mood. And it does, to me, get into the tone of Ice Cream Man, the, the twisted tone. It, it doesn't necessarily tell me anything about the story that happened in this issue that dealt with like a telethon. However, if I see this cover, I do know that I'm getting a book that is certainly out there and it ties into the, you know, the one character that's been tying this all together in some way. So because of that, because of just the, the sheer ingenuity of this book, just because of the, the way that it is still haunting my dreams since the moment I saw it, I felt like I, I had to include it. And Ice Cream Man's had a, a number of great covers and it's one of those issues where, the, one of those series where I feel like each issue now has a, a, a million covers because every store wants an exclusive. A lot of them I feel like kind of hit the same theme over and over again. This to me was one that shows there's a, a way to stand out from the crowd. It certainly did that with this cover. My next cover is one I think that people may look at and think that's really simple. Why would you pick that? Doesn't seem like anything special. So let me explain. And that's for Snow Angels number four. Uh, this is done by Jacques and this is, series itself was written by Jeff Lemire as well. And why did I pick this cover? Well, to me, Jeff Lemire, I know he didn't do this cover, but when I look at him as an artist, like he is the king at finding ways to express emotion with using the limited amount of lines. Like his his work, if you see his his work, especially in like Essex County, there's not a lot of lines on the page, but the emotions he gets from his characters is, is always there. Shulk is similar in the sense of he has a bit of a sketchy style, and to me, this cover gives me a lot as a person who's reading the series. When, when looking at those eyes, there's so much emotion in those eyes. I know to be cliche in a way we say that you know, eyes are the window to the soul. And to me, looking at this image, that's the reason why just seeing this man just in pain and agony with tears running down his face. I also like the little bit, if you notice that white stripe that's horse vertical on the page, you might not think much of it, but that gets into the entire story of Snow Angels. That That's really the, where the story is taking place in this ice cavern, this ice canyon, where these characters are trying to run away from this unrelenting monster, this unrelenting like, uh, snowman that is just designed to kill them and they're stuck they're trapped within that so to me with not using a, a lot on the page there's a lot of open space here but again that t ties into the book itself where everything is isolated into one specific area where the rest of the world it is just kind of a, a barren landscape in a way where you have really no place to go you're focused on the very thing that is trying to get you and because of that to me it's hinting stories and creativity and when it comes to emotion as well. And I'm always impressed too when people use the least amount to get the most out of a cover. And I felt like that really certainly hit that mold. I think Jock really hit a number on this. Jock has had a number of amazing covers. And I'm not going to say this is one of his best, but I did think it was very effective in setting the stage for this issue, especially as this being the last issue of the, of the first volume of this book. So I mentioned with Strange Adventures how each issue has had a really good cover, and that's the case too with Black Widow with issue number seven, this cover done by Adam Hughes. And Adam Hughes has been doing all the covers for this series, and some of the covers have been phenomenal. Some of my favorites of the year, one of my favorites of the year came earlier when it was Black Widow sitting on top of this uh, city landscape with Black Widow running down. And it was really cool too how he incorporated the actual credits, the, the writers and the artists within the neon lights as well. This of course is very different where you're getting this nine panel grid. The first thing I thought of actually was one of those photo booths you would go to like at the boardwalk or ever and get photos taken. It was almost like Black Widow went into that. It was getting her photo and the person behind the camera started trying to punch her. And unfortunately they forgot that was Black Widow. And by the end, you know, they're, they're led left in a, in a bloody heap. And I do love how that last little panel is left blank and it's distorted just to show the impact of her punch. It's a fun story within the cover itself. Again, this is a cover that has a story by itself. It doesn't necessarily link into exactly what the Black Widow story is going to be for this issue. But again, I feel like I find myself just adoring this cover, looking at it and enjoying what Adam Hughes put on the page, showing that you can kind of tell stories in different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be about setting up the story, like give you hints about, in this issue, someone's going to die, but rather, here's a fun story within itself. You like this bit, you like this little back and forth with Black Widow and, and, and the fight that she's having, well, guess what? You'll get more of that in the issue that's to come. So Black Widow's been one of Marvel's best series since its debut because it's been a complete package. Like the covers have been really consistently creative. Adam Hughes has been killing it. The art style inside has been great as well. And the story by Kelly Thompson and the artist has also been 
top notch. So with this complete package, I think that's to me when Marvel is at its best, when they can get a creative team from inside the book and outside the book to be clicking on all cylinders. And that's the case with Black Widow so far. Our next cover is one that is certainly fitting for a king with Sam Spratt's cover for Black Panther issue number 25. And I, I look at this cover and the first thing I see is something that personifies power, royalty, as well as struggle. We see Black Panther sitting on his throne with complete command, but underneath, kind of slowly emerging from the water, we have someone that I'm assuming is going to be T'Challa as he's kind of climbing his way back. To his rightful place and in the background we also see that this is uh, taking place in another earthly realm pretend perhaps space or something like that and it's again fitting for this story because this has been a storyline all about wakanda in space dealing with these other elements so to me this encapsulates not only the storyline that's been going in the, in the pages but just the thematic struggle that's been a part of the story since Tanahisi coach took it over and beyond that the imagery here is just phenomenal i mean that red really pops off the page you see it throughout you see the kind of in the flag you see it in the background and you see it kind of reflected in the water and i do wonder is is that kind of the blood of t'challa is is that what it's meant to represent is just simply a reflection i'm not fully sure but i do think it really adds to the image by making you ask those types of questions and like what is exactly is is going on here to me this is a, a fitting for this last issue you know it's going to be a landmark issue you want to cover that really captures everything about the run thus far captures the spirit of it and to me that's just what this cover does there's so much to love about it it's a really well put together image throughout both in story and design and the painterly quality to it gives it a, a great texture unlike really any other comic cover that came out this week we're now going to get to a very a different cover where, where Black Panther was all about power and its imagery jumped off the page immediately Philip Sevy's cover for Dead Dog's Bite number three is different. To me, this isn't something that at first maybe catches your eye. You don't see much in this cover that is all that remarkable, but as you slowly like look at it further and further, all these little bits kind of come out and you see that there's actually a lot of ingenuity within this cover. First, looking at the fact that you see this person drinking this thing of milk and on his clothes and on his like neck is actually the landscape of, of the town itself he is literally a living embodiment of this town and it makes sense because to be cliche this town has has been a huge character in this series thus far it's been a big part of what has made this book work as well as it did and as a series this has been one of my favorites it's every issue that's come out every week it's come out was my favorite of that given week which is particularly rare for me because I tend to put a lot of expectations on a book so the next issue just can never match those but this has been one that has, has done it and this book has also had a lot of elements of the surreal and you see that with this as well right where you're seeing this person drinking this thing of milk and you have blood dripping in, off their face and it looks like a classic ad except you you add that you know taking something that is common taking something that is wholesome or something that appears wholesome but showing you the underbelly that is much more darker and twisted and i think that is what this series has been doing thus far and then on top of that you have the missing person ad on the milk carton as well which has been a mainstay back in the day i don't think it's something that we really do anymore but again that ties into the narrative of this story because at the central piece of this story has been a, a missing person a person trying to find their friend who's gone missing so it ties every element of this this series into one still image it's interesting too because tyler bait who does everything for the book he's a writer artist is not the one doing this cover and i like his covers but i felt like this was a variant cover that was great to look at and i just love the little details like this is a variant cover where i feel like the person who is making this understands the book at least just as well as the person that's creating it or at least what i enjoy about the book itself so that's why it stood out because i love you know, sometimes you have those variant covers that look cool but look like nothing that's in the book or it seems to have nothing to do with the book that you're reading especially even for indie series, but that wasn't the case here. So all those little bits, all those abil that ability to kind of capture so many uh, parts of why I love this story and one image that at first doesn't look like anything all that remarkable is what made it such a standout cover for me. 
We're going to get to another series that has consistently great covers, and that's Rorschach for issue number eight. And this is done by Jorge Farnes. Is, to me, is having a year with this book. He's not doing a lot of books. He's putting all this time and effort in this Rorschach series, and it's been paying off. And the last, this issue itself was one I, I really adored. I know I saw some people, some ramblings that thought it was tough to get through, and I kind of get that because it is wordy. But on the craftsmanship standpoint, at least looking at Jorge Farnes' art, you can't deny that objectively it's pretty it's pretty great and this cover itself i think ties into a lot of that what's really cool about it is the fact that i know the rorschach three-way i saw a lot of people poking fun of that joke because it's like rorschach three-way is the last thing you want in your life however it does get into how this book is structured and the fact that you have three concurrent storylines going on at the same time and that's what you have in this cover and that is to me again what's made these covers so great is how they kind of clued you into the craftsmanship that will be taking place in the issue and taking that classic warshack iconography that imagery and incorporating it in fun in different ways or at least creative ways and that's again the case here with this road sign and all these paths converging and again narratively that fits into where this is so far you know as the story starting to kind of come together a bit so i i've been majorly impressed with what Hori Furness is doing with this like i, I love this work for a book like hot Lunch special a few years ago for aftershock comics and to me i saw something there like this art this artist has something and he, he's done batman but i think you know looking at potential eisners i don't know if this will get it because i think there's a lot of people that will simply dismiss it Again, it's because it's something that is linked to Watchmen. But as a book, if you remove that piece, if you can, I think you know, objectively there's there's some remarkable stuff happening in this series. And I think Corey Fornius at least deserves some recognition, especially just looking at the covers. And issue eight's cover has you know fits into that mold just as well. Okay, now let's have some fun with X-Men issue number 20 and this cover done by Mike, Mike Del Mundo. And, okay, does this have much story? Does it tie into what's really going on in the X-Men? Maybe. There's so much going on in the X-Men. Maybe there's a, a story out there about Mystique creating some sort of copy, copy device in order to take over the world. I don't know. It's been weird, but... I've been enjoying it. I just think this is hilarious as hell, you know, taking the idea of like photoshopping your face, but using Mystique who can, you know, change your design. It's just in the spirit of just the insanity of this book. Tonally, again, this kind of goes against what I've been saying because I don't think tonally this was going to sit into the world of X-Men all that well. I might set up different expectations thinking, oh, this is going to be a fun, joyful series. And so far, the X-Men hasn't really been that. Some of the series have been, like Hellions has been rather humorous and fun, where the X-Men book, not so much. But I think just, I don't know, maybe this was, they gave Mike Del Mundo a rope to say, hey, do a cover featuring Mystique. He, he racked his brain and came up with this fun image. It's also a hard cover to do. Look at all those different characters. Yes, a great, just the photo image of, uh, and just being able to kind of nail it so, you know, it looks like the person, but also looks like how they would look through the, the morphed look of a copier. And I wonder if a lot of kids today even know what copiers are. Do they even use them? Because paper has kind of gone by the wayside. I don't know. That's not important. But it does make me want, like, uh, an office space type of sitcom starring Marvel characters. At least maybe in, in like an animated form or something like that or shorts i think it could be fun because you could take bits like this and i think run with it anyway so because of that just because i laughed at this when i saw it i'm like that's that is fun and it may break some of my rules that i've been talking about there's not much story here per se it's kind of not in line with the actual cover but where it does hit it again is coming to be being creative and fun and that can take you a long way and that's certainly the case for this cover done again by mike Mundo for x-men number 20. I already mentioned up front when it came to doing these covers. Not, they're not necessarily in order, at least for this week. Maybe in future weeks, I'll change that. I'm curious if people prefer them in an order or something like that. But I did mention I did want to save my favorite for last. And by process of elimination, if you looked at the thumbnail for this, you're going to guess what it is. But let me explain why. And it's Bruno Redondo's cover for Nightwing number 79. And this is the second printing cover. And I got to say, he must have at least had an idea that this book was going to go to second print because come on man look at that cover it i talked about the issue last week when i did my review of it in my top 10 and i mentioned the word that came to mind was delightful because it was a delight to read and when i look at that cover again bruno and Dondo does the interiors and also that cover i i get the same feeling mm -hmm. is it specifically looking at the exact story not necessarily but i think it is getting into the spirit 
of the comic series, what's going on right now in Nightwing, and also the, the character himself. I feel like you can give this image to someone that's never heard about Nightwing, and you can kind of see the progression and, and get his style. And I love just the homage to the 66 Batman as well. And I think you know, the Nightwing series isn't the same when it comes to humor. It's, of course, not as wacky or, you know, it's something that is feels like you're listening to Adam West talk out loud. But I do think in the sense of it's trying to put in a tone that is make, makes you kind of laugh with Guy or, or enjoy what you're, you're reading. It's not something that's dour and down to earth like a, your typical Batman book. That is what the book has been about. And to me, this is what the cover has been about. And it captures that spirit. It gives you a brief history of the of Nightwing all in one image. And got a little Barbara Gordon also kind of opening the window as well, just to add a little bit to it. And again, this is capturing the spirit of what I've loved about the series thus far in, in one image. And I mentioned, like, I'm a person that doesn't buy a comic just for the cover. You know, I, I, I get it because I want to read it. I did change that stance for this issue because I'm like, this is a cover that I, I, I do want to own because I, I do think it, it's something special here. And again, it's not just that it looks cool or it, it does look cool, but it's just there's so much to it. And uh, I, I find that Bruno Rondano is kind of hitting it on all cylinders with this book. And, and this cover is no is no exception. And I do think that they must have had a good feeling because right when they announced the second print, this image was out uh, immediately with it. So you don't do I, I couldn't imagine you just like whipping this up in an afternoon if he did more power to him because man it's a great looking cover and again for an issue that actually came out last month but it, it's a second printing that came out the week that i'm doing this i so. think it will also live on i think maybe even beyond this series because it's a very timeless image it, it does tie into the book in the sense of getting the spirit of the book but story wise image wise you can kind of keep this on its own and it's, it's all you need like you know i don't i don't really do Know, comic book posters anymore but if i did you know back in my college days I, I would love to put this on the wall this has been one of dc's best books since it first came out for a number of reasons and bruno ronaldo and tom taylor have been killing it and i do think covers are a part of it i think when you have a book that has great consistent covers that are in line with the story being told that to me tells me that the creative team is just kind of getting it they're, they're they're just clicking with one another like i mentioned with black widow i feel that's been the case with that it's been a marvel's one of marvel's best books and if it can maintain that and i think about the series that i've loved one of my favorite some of my favorite marvel series like the nova series from like 2008 2009 i think of the covers and what was inside the pages as well so i, I do think covers can play a role outside of just being cool or, or looking cool and that's kind of why i wanted to do this series to kind of showcase the covers i feel like stand out for, for different reasons so so anyway so those are my favorite covers for the month of may where are some of your favorite covers where are some that i missed like i mentioned I, I did try to look at all the ones and but there's always a lot of covers so maybe i miss ones that deserve to be recognized let me know in the comment section below you know what you think of this series is this something you would like me to continue to do because that's what this channel has been about right now it's just trying things, seeing how they work, and then adjusting as necessary. But I do appreciate you uh, taking the time to watch this video. I know there's a ton of comic book channels out there, so I appreciate any view, any reaction that I get. Just remember that comics are for everyone. The key is finding the right one. Until next time, keep reading.